International humanitarian assistance is a multi-billion dollar enterprise. But is much of the aid doing more harm than good? That's the controversial question raised by my guest today. Linda Polman is a Dutch writer and journalist who's covered conflict and humanitarian crises from Haiti to Darfur, Eastern Congo and Afghanistan. There are situations, she says, in which the best thing the aid givers can do is walk away. But does that mean we turn our backs on a world of human suffering? Linda Polman, welcome to Hard Talk. Thank you. Let me begin with the basic philosophy espoused by the International Committee for the Red Cross. They believe that humanitarian assistance should be independent, neutral, and impartial. Do you believe that's impossible? Well, it depends on how aid is received. You can give it in an independent, neutral, and impartial way. But if the people that you give it to mistreat the aid, if they use it for their own causes, then you can sort of be Alice in Wonderland to say, but I'm neutral. But if the aid is not being uh, used in a neutral way, if it's not being received in a neutral way, then, uh, then it is pointless to, uh, to hold on to that neutrality principle. And is it your contention that as soon as an international agency, whether it be the Red Cross or another NGO, or indeed the UN, as soon as they begin to believe that the assistance they offer is being abused, they have a duty to stop offering that assistance? Well, it's obviously it depends on, on the amount of, of abuse that is being made but with your aid. Um, we all know the instances where a rebel takes off with a bag of rice, for example, which is perhaps not what we want to happen with that bag of rice, but it happens. But there are many instances, there are many uh, cases in, in which uh, uh, the, uh, the abuse of aid runs into the hundreds of millions of dollars. For example, right now in Somalia, the World Food Program is under investigation, not because the World Food Program is the only NGO there um, who, whose aid is being abused, but because it is the biggest NGO there and the abuse is being done in the biggest way there. So right now there's a report uh, at the UN Security Council which, uh, which um, uh, invest where, where the conclusions of the investigations are being, that, that have been done. Um, the World Food Programme um, donates um, more than $400 million worth of food aid, of which this, uh, uh, the investigators believe that half is actually disappearing straight into the pockets of local warlords. But you're so that's to you $200 million sure. per year. Uh, and, and we can talk more about the scale of what you see as the abuse, but to return to the uh, opening point you made there, you would accept it's a grey area, that it isn't simply a question of, of saying that, that the way international aid works today is fundamentally flawed because abuse has ruined the principle of, upon which it was originally based. Well, there are some fundamental flaws in the international aid operations as they are set up in these days. But obviously, you, every time you have to make a balance, every time again, you have to do the analysis. But you it strikes me that, if I may, you always leap to the very negative cases. I mean, you know, you've written a book which caused a big stir in the humanitarian and aid world. You've written a book which is based upon case studies which are, it has to be said, uniformly negative. And you start, and perhaps the biggest, most important case is 1994 and what happened in Rwanda, and particularly what happened in eastern Congo when hundreds of thousands of refugees fled from the Rwandan genocide yeah. and from the conflict there into East Congo. Yeah. You've built a whole theory around that, haven't you? Um, well, I've, I've based myself on the facts as what, what happened there. Um, that's a disaster, the 1994 disaster in Goma, the neighboring country of in Rwanda. Congo, yeah. it, it went into the annals of the, uh, of the history of humanitarian aid as a total ethical disaster. This is where humanitarian organizations themselves start sort of uh, thinking and start, uh, start analyzing the things that are going wrong with humanitarian aid operations all the time. And in brief, the, the, the feeling that it went so badly wrong was because so much of the aid was poured into camps in that strip of land around Goma in eastern Congo and actually appeared to be giving succor to the people 
who were responsible for the genocidal killing of Tutsis inside Rwanda and who'd crossed the border. Yes, yes. What we, um, uh, what we didn't uh, realize enough at the time is that the people who we actually saw entering the camps, the people who we saw stumbling out of Rwanda, uh, they were actually not the victims of the, or the survivors of the genocide that had taken place in Rwanda, but it was the other side. It was the people who perpetrated the genocide. So it but was, not entirely, it was, it was very... it? You see, this is where it gets complicated and where I start mm. to talk about grey areas, because you paint this hellish picture of millions of dollars going to helping people who in your view were fundamentally responsible for genocide when my point would be it actually is much more complicated than that there were substantial numbers hun tens hundreds of thousands of Hutu civilians who would have been in grave danger had they stayed in Rwanda who were genuinely refugees and who were exposed to cholera dysentery uh, lack of food and who needed help w yes, were yes. they to be abandoned well you well, you, you have to realize that what actually happened there is that the entire extremist Hutu government moved into the camps they brought their entire Hutu uh, army into the into the camps and they brought all their militants and fighters into the camps. But my point is so, there were so hundreds the, the of thousands whole... of people in the camps and not all of them were involved in the government or the militia or anything else. And we now know, because it's become plain from uh, leaks of draft UN documents, that the Tutsis, some of whom followed the Hutus into East Congo were intent upon killing them because we have reports from 95, 96, 97 of terrible massacres yes. conducted on Hutu civilians. Yes. So there was a case for protecting them and there was a case for making sure they stayed alive. But they were not being protected inside the camps. They were just being fed inside the camps. The NGOs there were unable to protect the people. So what actually happened is the war was perpetrated from, from the camps. Um, the, the army was, uh, was rearming itself in the camps uh, in between the, the eight flights that were coming in with uh, with food and medicines for the refugees inside that camp there were also armed flights for example weapons were being flown in so the uh, the NGOs were actually right in the middle of an ongoing war there and they were feeding one side of the war and they were and they were uh, giving medical care to one side of the war and enabling the the Hutu army and the Hutu government to continue their war from the camp so those so civilians, you could say if that I may, the those civilians should have been abandoned should they Leave aside the Interahamwe and leave aside the militia and the government people, but the tens of thousands of civilians who faced death if they didn't receive food and some sort of support, they should have been abandoned because they, were, um, they had in their midst bad people. Well, the, uh, the aid operation uh, inside that camp uh, uh, went on for two years and um, uh, everybody within the aid uh, world will also ag agree that two years was much too long. The big crisis uh, inside the camps, the people dying of cholera, for example, has had, had been uh, tackled uh, in qu quite at the beginning of that, uh, of that aid operation. The aid organizations and the aid money kept pouring in. Uh, without there being an, an, a, a necessity for that, the, um, 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 the aid operation went, went on and on, enabling the Hutu army to rearm and to, and to get and to strengthen itself. But in your negative view of the impact aid have uh, had, don't you also have a duty to consider what might have happened if the aid hadn't been given? And surely if the aid hadn't been given, some civilians, substantial numbers would have died. But also the Hutu militants, the Interahamwe, would still have regrouped, rearmed and terrorized people in the neighborhood because yeah. they had that intention whether the aid was coming in or not. And they had the capability because they had knives, they had... Uh, weapons and they would have intimidated the local Congolese population. Yes, well, I was there at the time, and uh, I was also there when about when more than half a million Hutus actually did go back to Rwanda on foot from from the camps after the, the Tutsis decided to close those camps. Over half a million Hutus went back to Rwanda, and they're they're still there. So uh, it is it is not like um, every Hutu that came back to Rwanda or that stayed in Rwanda was, was killed. No, but tens of thousands we now know were killed in East. In Congo by Tutsis. Yes, and also tens of thousands were killed inside the camps. Sure, but there's no, that, that's the point, isn't it? There's no good and there's no bad in many of these conflicts, or at least there is both good and bad Th at the same is, time. And there are also innocent civilians, and yes. aid groups have to take a very difficult set of decisions about whether or not they keep people alive. Yes. And I'm no, just asking no, you whether, in all seriousness, you're suggesting that people should not be kept yeah. alive. No, the aid organizations actually uh, deny that it is that their responsibility to make choices. The aid organizations 
institutions have this basic principle in which they say we are humanitarians. Our humanitarian duty is to help people, no questions asked. We do not care who the victims are. We do not, not care why they are. We are only here to help. They feel that they are not obliged to, to uh, take into consideration the larger context of aid operations. So if their aid is being abused in Hutu camps or in camps in Darfur as it's happening at the moment, or in, or in Afghanistan, for example, aid organizations feel it is not their responsibility. Politics they should, turn a blind eye, that. in your view. They deny that it is their responsibility. They are being used in, in wars as, as uh, military tools, as political well, tools, I, I want but, to come but, but they say that it is still not our responsibility. Yeah, I want to come back us. to precisely what you believe to be in the mind of the NGOs and the aid agencies in a moment. But before we do that, there's something very striking that you do in your book that's been uh, very powerful, had a powerful impact on people. You make it very effective use of, of an analogy with the Nazis in the Second World yeah. War. You say, would it have been right, for example, to drop off humanitarian aid at the gates of a camp like Auschwitz yeah. if the Nazis said, you know what, we'll take care of the aid and we'll distribute it as we see fit? Yeah. And you ask the question, would it have been right to leave that aid? I say to you that that's a very unfair and misleading analogy because if we're dealing with broken societies in sub-Saharan Africa there is no force like the Nazis which has complete control of the situation so if you're trying to get aid into Eastern Congo or to Darfur it isn't a question of dealing with a malign force like the Nazis um, you, I think you are underestimating what is actually happening in practice. You are underestimating how refugee camps are, are, can be militarized places. Refugee camps are often in the parameters of, uh, of wars. Uh, you must realize that uh, refugee camps are being used and abused by armies and by rebel groups. But I mean, we, we, to, I have to, been to, to many to stall, refugee to camps in the course people, of my yeah. journalistic career, and I've been aware of fundamental problems, many of which you've alluded to, in East Congo and other camps that I've seen. But I have never drawn a direct parallel in what I've seen to the running of a camp like Auschwitz. It seems to me you've taken your example to a completely misleading extreme. No, it's not misleading. It is making, you can, you can offer, often you understand the dilemma better if you compare it to a situation that has been, that is very much part of our own history. We are, we very much more relate to what happened in Auschwitz, that is where our set of moral standards start and finish, than we, uh, than we take, uh, than we can uh, compare our situation with a refugee camp in Darfur, for example. So if you want to make clear at, with what moral standards and what moral dilemmas you're actually dealing inside refugee crisis or inside uh, uh, famines that have been caused on purpose, for example, then I, th I believe it is, uh, it is justified to use an example which, which we can all relate to. But we the all, message, we of all course, understand. Okay, so the message, of course, is just as nobody would consider it reasonable to leave aid on the doorsteps of Auschwitz, you're suggesting it's entirely unreasonable to leave aid on the doorstep of, for example, a UNDP displaced persons camp in Darfur. No, we. The, the thing well, is that's that, the logic that you're, the, the, you're the, the thing is that that you have to make a balance. You have to know what your aid is actually doing, what what consequences your aid is having inside war crisis, inside refugee crisis. You have to make a balance. If if the balance goes into the direction of your aid doing more harm than good, if the balance goes into your aid actually. Uh, intensifying wars and prolonging wars, then you have to ask yourself a question. Is it, is it uh, better, is it in the interest of the victims to, to stay or is it in the, interesting, or the interest of the victims to find other ways to aid them? Well, we'll talk about the other ways, but I just want to point out you've upset an awful lot of people in the humanitarian and aid business, if I can put yes. it that way, with your analysis. I mean, D Desmond Tutu, for example, talks about aid critics who ignore the benefits that aid has brought to millions of people. They're at best misguided, at worst putting the, I, their ideology before the lives of poor men, women and children. Oxfam point out that in the last 10 years, measurably 30 million people, uh, or 30 million children I should say, have been educated because of international aid efforts. Vast numbers of people have got HIV treatment because of international aid efforts. The same with the combating of malaria. These are tangible results delivered by international aid, are they not? Yes, but there's nowhere in my book where I deny that aid is saving lives 
and that it is improving lives. I'm only saying in my book that in many cases, aid can be delivered in a much better and much less harmful way. So um, um, it is a pity that um, uh, uh, discussions about aid are often so very emotionally laden. Um, you should um, um, uh, try, try to keep it objective. You should try to, to take the emotions out of it. Try to keep it objective. Yeah, I mean, I mean you know, we, we, can, we can talk about the micro picture of the, of the little child in a refugee camp with flies in its nose and with the big belly because out of hunger, you know, and that you can, you can use as a sort of justification for aid, you know. Uh, but you, you should also take but, the, but the I'm, larger context I'm, I'm, I'm precisely into not doing that. That's why I'm using the, 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 the macro picture, the, yes. the 30 million children being schooled because of international yes. aid interventions I mean the point seems to be that you have a feeling that international aid is driven by this you use the word caravanserai this sort of misery caravan the, the sort of fashionable uh, human catastrophe where all of the aid agencies flood in there's massive inefficiency competition to win the most money from the international community and things go wrong very quickly but I would put it to you from my own journalistic career as much as anything else that I see in all different sorts of uh, difficult places, international aid commitments over the long term helping communities in a very tangible way. Do you not see that? Yes, I do, but I also see the many things that go wrong on a large scale. And I believe that we are responsible for delivering the aid in the best way possible. If we can improve things about aid, then we should not, uh, not do that. We should deliver aid in the best way possible. And I'm happy to say that, there, yes, there are a lot of uh, people who feel that, uh, that, uh, that, um, that um, uh, you should not criticize aid because, because aid is saving people. I can also report to you that there's lots of uh, people inside the aid world who are making exactly the same analysis as I do and who actually, uh, who but, actually suggest yeah, but, but, ways but, but in which respect, you can do But with respect, what they better. say you're not doing is, is acknowledging how much things have changed since 94. A lot of learning was done in 94, as you said. Phil Bloomer, uh, Oxfam policy director, says that right now, today, uh, we need a grown-up debate about the many successes as well as some of the isolated failures that yes. we've seen in the humanitarian yes. assistance yes. Yes. world. But yes. he says you don't pay account to the successes. Well, I mean, only, only a week ago a, a, a new report emerged from the, from, from the Overseas Development Institute um, in England. Um, um, Who, by the way, have spent a lot of time criticizing your work. Yes, but uh, they, they, they came back on their rather emotional arguments that they used uh, uh, soon after the book came out. Uh, their, their, their latest analysis of the book is that they actually follow 99% um, uh, of the conclusions that I make um, and, they, and they are actually calling for uh, a renewed uh, action to um, make aid better. They are actually saying that it is now time to force aid organizations to follow up on their own suggestions about aid, how aid can but be But there is auditing and, how, and monitoring and, and there has been for quite a long time. I mean, that's nothing new. This is very true. There, there, are, there, there have been so many but seminars, if, conferences, codes of conduct, etc. But, you know, but, but all of them, <laughs> all of them are not binding. But when you say that to me and you talk about, oh, there have been so many conferences and seminars, there is a strand of cynicism I pick up in your view of the international well, I, humanitarian I find it, business. I find it extremely uh, depressing to, to know that the international aid world woke up in 1994-1995 in Goma. But, but and, 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 in, and in 2010 they, they have to admit that not a lot has changed. But hang on a minute, you say some very powerful things. You describe these NGOs as, quote, businesses dressed up like Mother Teresa. The aid industry, the media and the warmongers the world over are locked in a cycle of mutual support. You're saying something very profound here. You're yes. saying that in the end, many of these agencies, whether they be UN, Red Cross or whatever, are complicit, yes. Yes. complicit with the warmongers. Uh, they are vol they, they put themselves um, into into their into their claws as hostages in a voluntary no, way. No, you're saying with respect, you're saying something bigger than that. You're saying that because of the the big SUVs and the tax-free salaries and the whole rigmarole that goes with the international aid industry, these people get sucked into a, a sort of way of thinking which is actually malign. Which you equate and you suggested that perhaps there should be court. Uh, courtroom appearances by some NGOs, you suggest is complicity in war crimes. Yes, it is one of the 
major uh, suggestions that the ODI is making now uh, to make it possible to uh, complain and to uh, about aid, failure of aid operations and bad performances of aid organizations and to make it actually possible to uh, to ho hold them accountable and to bring them to court if they if they fail to do to do what they promised to do. do you, so I mean, in your it is also it is also it's, it's a big claim to make. Are world. you telling me that in your experience and goodness knows you've travelled from Haiti to Darfur to Eastern Congo? Are you saying you have experienced situations where you believe? that NGOs, humanitarian agencies, were doing things which should have led them into some sort of international courtroom? Um, well, I mean, you could uh, let some lawyers go loose on uh, what is happening inside Sudan, for example, for the past quarter of a century, where international aid organizations are actually um, um, vo volunteering to aid a very um, um, uh, um, cruel military government well hang on a minute they're not to, volunteering to, to aid this government they have to uh, recognize a reality which is that they have to to a certain extent work with this government to get the aid to the displaced persons who they believe would be in grave danger if they didn't offer them assistance and there's no way of doing it without the cooperation of the cartoon government yeah but you are now you are now suggesting in your in your questions that to say no to a crisis is not an option but you're suggesting that, that, to that say you, yes to helping people is a crime it, 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 can, it can amount into being a crime if you assist a government in committing a crime. If, if a government uh, uses your, your aid to feed its own troops to extend wars and it uses it against its opponents, then uh, the government, that government in question, is committing a war crime. What? And, and if, if you enable that government to do that, whether you do it willingly or consciously or not, if you are enabling a government to do that and you, and you pursue in doing that for a quarter of a century, then I believe it is time to get some serious questions about what you have been doing. This is all very sensitive stuff. There will be people watching this across the world who may well, for example, every month give $10 or £10 yes. a month to their bank to go to a, an international NGO. Yeah. Are you suggesting to them, and you've used the phrase about solving their, their own guilt and their consciences, are you suggesting to them that that money in essence is doing no good and that they might as well stop no I am no I am saying that you should not just blindly give you should not just give to any organization that says I'm going in there in some sensitive war zone for example I'm going in there to help people but organizations, I, I believe organizations that have important moved on a great if, deal if you they, decide, they say that they have systems which monitor and audit where their aid goes and they can tell the donors what happens to every penny that they spend yeah there are also many researches many reports and like the one that I mentioned that came out last week uh, that's that's uh, uh, actually say that they don't know they they uh, they are not uh, helping and they are uh, the the control mechanisms that they have put in place are actually um, uh, powerless and quite useless because it is codes of conduct that suggest uh, uh, ways of of, uh, uh, of controlling the aid in, in a word because we almost must end but it is a very depressing outlook you have for a rich world that is wrestling with different ways to help the poorer world you seem to be saying that at the moment the system simply does not work uh, I'm saying that the system can be improved a lot and I believe it is our responsibility to do it as good as we can. And this is why we have to, uh, to give all these questions that are raised in the book serious consideration. Because if you just continue the way you do it now, you are missing opportunity. You could do it a lot better. Linda Pullman, we have to end it there. I'm sorry because there's so much more to talk about, but thanks for being on Hard Talk. You're welcome. Thank you very much.